Welcome to CivilNet. This is your host, Eric Kopian, and we are truly honored today to have as our guest a person who really needs no introduction, uh, businessman, philanthropist, and the uh, co-founder of the Aurora Prize, Ruben Vartanian. Mr. Vartanian, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Uh, since the, uh, the results of, these, of the war that we went through last year, you and many other notables in our community have started a new project. Uh, which is called the Future Armenian Project. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you a chance to explain to people what this is, what the goals are, uh, and what are you trying to accomplish collectively in this process. Thank you. I think <clears throat> we all realize that this is the unique time for Armenian nation and Armenian state. And when the crisis decides happening, you always need to be ready to use this crisis for transformation. Because it's a very sad time for Armenians, it's a very difficult time for us. But at the same time, we all believe that this is a great opportunity to rethink about many things, change some of the approaches that have been done before, and try to do something differently. So I uh, it's the not, not new initiatives we've been with Nubar Afian and Artur and other many of our friends and uh, colleagues been doing it, Pierre and uh, Gore and many other people. Last 20 years we've been doing Army 2020. But after the war we realized that one of the key points is engagement of the people to be feel this is transformation they also want to be part of this transformation. That's why this new initiative started saying, okay, we don't want to give the answers, we want to raise the key points so people can talk and debate about what's the, what kind of future we want to collectively to see about our nation, about our state, our relationship between the state and diaspora, uh, about our relationship between Armenia and Artsakh. Again, many very difficult questions was raised without answer, and unfortunately what we realized all debate was going inside of Armenia, not going on this level. It's going on a level about who is guilty, who was corrupt, who was doing wrong, who is doing right, and how you do revenge, how you punish the people. And what we hope is launching this initiative, this, this discussion will go another level. Uh, obviously, yes, we're, we're in a low level of uh, negativity, and there's not enough conversation about what needs to be done. Uh, However, in a very, you know, living here, it's, it's very strange. As all these fights are going on, there's actually a few things that people do agree on. And uh, I always say it's from, you know, the, the local taxi driver, Truba Bartonia, they all agree with, in three things. And that is what I call the three competencies. Uh, everyone understands that with the experience that we went through, that we don't have a competent state that obviously we didn't have a competent military to the extent that we wanted it to. And the base of that is having a competent economy because without a competent econ economic system, you cannot accomplish those other two. It is really very, no historical precedence for that. How do you see this initiative and the conversations that come from it that can pu push us towards these three competencies? I think you're touching the key point of all <clears throat> problems security, prosperity, identity, and how we can really uh, <clears throat> make that transformation and achieve the good result with the resources. One of the, I think we have a couple challenges which we need, we need to openly talk and, face and realize how we can find a solution to this, uh, managing these challenges. The one, we're living in the myths and illusions, and I think one of the key points of this crisis to get out of these myths and illusions. We had the myths about our army was the strongest, we had the myths about many things which I don't want to go now uh, because we don't have enough time, but I think it's critical to talk open and transparent about what is real and what is fake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the world in general going in the fake reality, but let's try to mm -hmm. use this momentum to go out of these illusions. Mm -hmm. The second point, which I think is very critical also, what kind of resources we have, not only inside of Armenia, but outside of Armenia, and can we utilize, can we use these resources? When I say resources is uh, not only about money, it's about the brain, experienced people, managers, people who really can make the changes. Because one of the core questions, are we talking about 
Armenians in Armenia? Are we talking about Armenian nation in general? Are we talking about Armenia in the world? Or are we talking about Armenia isolation in, inside its own problem? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the third issue, I think, is in end, it's uh, what is the public social contract between the different groups of people, what we all agree? Because the model which was <coughs> established 30 years ago was very simple. The diaspora, you can give us advice, you can send us charity money, you can do remittance, but, but don't interfere what we're doing here because we won the war, we, won the war. we are living here, you're not living here. And not only diaspora, by the way, who've been, like yourself, been from non-Armenian uh, background, but people who've been born in Armenia and left Armenia with Armenian passport, mm -hmm. they have no right to vote, they have no right to be... Mm -hmm. Again, it was clear line between... Demarcation. The, the market. And I think it was it was worked well for both sides, by the way. I want to say diaspora also been uh, agree with this model. The question number one, are we are ready to change this contract in a different way and say, you know, no, we need to only together with mutualism, with the partnership, with the responsibility on both sides. For example, we all know what in Armenian holding passports, people living out of the Armenia around six hundred thousand people. Now Today, they don't have a right to vote if they're not flying back to Armenia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The question, do we want to give them rights without any uh, additional requirements, or do we want to give them rights to vote only if they're paying a fixed amount of money of tax to support Armenia, or they're serving in the army six months a year, or whatever, well, not two years, but six months, or something other conditions we mm -hmm. can put and say, you know what, if you're following this requirement, you will have a right to vote, despite you not living in Armenia. And I'm just bringing one example that's showing, can we rethink and, and reestablish the new contract between the diaspora and Armenian, so who lives in Armenia, without this serious re Re revision, a revision about this um, relationship, we cannot do, make the changes about economy, about security, about the state, because the key challenge is the management and the competence of the managing the private sector or public sector, uh, by the way, and diaspora institutions also. It's not a question that we have a crisis only in Armenian state. We have a serious issues about what's happening in the diaspora institutions also. So I, I think it's a very important to, like I said, talk openly about all these things and try to find the mechanism we allow to maximize, utilize the best source that we have in our, always been our history, is our main brain and smart people. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the criticism, not the criticisms, the, the, the notice about the diaspora because one of the things I've always been very vocal about is the failures of our diaspora institutions because as, as our Armenia institutions have failed, so have our diaspora institutions and it's very important, especially for people who come from the diaspora to actually point that out and not have this silly superiority complex about, you know, what you're doing wrong or someone's doing right. We, we collectively failed across the board. Sure. Um, I'm going to ask you. Uh, it's going to be a difficult question, uh, but I think uh, I think it's a, it's an important one. In the last uh, six months, during I would say from the war on, uh, we saw a situation where, and I, I I see countless reports, feedback from the war, and one of the things that you hear is that the, essentially the best part of our army were 18, 19 year old conscripts, who, despite the failures of their leadership, and many others, essentially. <coughs> fought like hell and in many cases sacrificed their lives for us. Uh, in some ways, we're eternally indebted to them. Uh, and then, so what I see is, is a collective, is a society in which the people who had the least, in many ways, did the most. And in fact, you can't do any more than giving your life. Sure. Uh, while the nation collectively, you know, uh, you know, as the, the other day we were talking about that the top 20 Armenians in the world have more than $50 billion in assets. And during the war, we collected $170 million for Armenia Fund, which, as we know, could have been given by one person. Uh, what can we, and this is not a question of shaming individuals, this is not what it's about. What do we need to do to get out of a situation in which the least among us do the most, well, the most among us do the least? But Eric, you, you, we're going back to the question, why the person who living in Paris or Moscow or LA needs to pay or give the <coughs> money for inefficient system with the people just asking, give us money, 
and don't interrupt. Mm -hmm. And not only we feel that we've been screwed up many times, but also we don't feel in touch with what we are Armenian. And mm -hmm. I think just asking the, again, obligations without giving something what people feel proud to be Armenian and proud to be part of this Armenian society, I think is unfair. And I'm not trying to compare the what's happened to these 4,000 kids who give their lives and it was the part of the, again, the model would saying is Armenians in Armenia have a duty to go to serve army and the fight for Armenians. Other people outside of Armenia, if you want to help, you can help, you don't want to, you don't help. The model was very vague and very bad from both sides. And again, the question when you talk about the, the wealth, the person needs to think about what I'm doing with my wealth. In the end, is a, her own, his choice with understanding of the, what kind of the, uh, what kind of the input he will have. Because we all know about $170 million would be that. Already was many questions raised, how efficiently this money was used. How money was, was no transparency. Mm -hmm. It was no efficiency about the communication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I won't tell you, Aurora wrote twice letters about asking where is money, what's happened with the money, because you know, we did the, Aurora put the money directly to Artsakh programs. We made 75 programs in Artsakh immediately after the war, but been, we gave also give money to the fund and we were struggling to get answer about mm -hmm. what's happening with the money and what is the, mm -hmm. what is, again, it's unfortunately, it's not only a question about your commitment to Armenian roots, the question about how you want to feel being successful and proud about, what not only about doing good things, but only in bad time, how well you can organize to, mm -hmm. for example, there was no meeting, of, it was no call to the people saying, you know what, let's come together and see what we can do together. It was not public-private partnership, don't exist in Armenia. Mm -hmm. We're talking about only give us money like you're paying tax, and people saying, why I need to pay tax? I'm doing as much as I wanted, but you don't need to push me to give me more. So why, I'm talking about Kirk 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 Marne, three billion dollars, who he left in a charity. He left without mentioning Armenia at all, right? And uh, it was a good question, why, after so many years, and a person who made one of the biggest contributions to Armenia, mm -hmm. uh, finally decided to give all the money to charity, but didn't mention Armenia. I think it's a good question to talk and discuss. I think, uh, I'm glad you, I mean, this push and pull is good because I think the, uh, these are uncomfortable questions, but I, I think, yeah, I, I know, I've, I, I, was, I was looking at it from one perspective, but I think there's, you know, this needs to be a work in progress and a partnership. Uh, it's not just, uh, it's not just putting demands on people. Uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, living here, you sort of see what works and you see what doesn't work. And the one thing that does work is what I call uh, the establishment of islands of excellence. Because what we lack in this country is enough islands of excellence. For example, we have you know some of the finest doctors in the world, specialists from here to Moscow to Los Angeles to New York to London. And there's not a single world-class hospital in Armenia. You know, we have some of the finest academics in the world and we don't have a university that's in the top 500 in the world. Uh, however, uh, over the last 15, 20 years, many people, for example, what you have done with Aurora, whether it's UWC Fast, you've created these, an island of excellence. You have Sam Simonian with Tumo, it's another mm -hmm. one. You have even individual business people like Ernekian who kickstarted the wine industry in Armenia, which has sort of taken on off its own. We have few islands of excellence. What we need is multiple, multiple islands of excellence. How do you see your current initiative leading to the creation of, instead of having two auroras and two malls, having 20 of them. How do you see this initiative leading to that? I think you're asking a very important question, Eric. Um, we analyzed, unfortunately, again, 2020 was our milestone, which we put when we started the program with Nubar and many other, other partners, looking about future of Armenia. And we failed to convince the government, and this time was the Robert Kocharyan, after the Serge Sarkisian, after it was, doesn't matter who was in the power, we failed to have a private-public partnership model. And I said, okay, let's assume we are not against us, we're not doing anything political, we're doing our project, we can change the Armenia without interference with the government. Mm -hmm. And overall, just for point of being clear, we made uh, 700 projects in Armenia during those 20 years, around 700 projects. And we put around $700 million money to Armenia. 
uh, half of the money comes from our family, and this is most of my wealth. That's why I'm feeling very old. easy to talk about why you didn't put money. I put most of my my family put most of our wealth to Armenia, but it's not enough. It was not a question about how much you put your own money, how much you raise other people's money, because it was clearly a mistake which we realize and acknowledge. But just doing an excellent project without transformation of the society and bringing the new standards, not by leading by example, by really building the new system and engaging the diaspora to come to live here, not just to provide some of the support on doing some projects, is not working. That's why one of the main conclusions that we made during this 20 years journey we've been doing with my partners and my family members Without making a strong deal between the state and society, you cannot change the country. Without both sides taking obligations and responsibilities and rights, you cannot change the country. Just hoping what you will do and slowly it will change, it didn't work because we've been no war, no peace situation and the development of the country was so unrealistic or non-correlated to the reality that was around us. But this show us now, after unfortunately the fall of 2020, but this is, was wrong strategy from internal and external and from diaspora and from the government side. And it was, doesn't matter who was in the power. The question was, what are not, we, we are we did the same mistake, was saying, oh, it's no peace, no war. We'll try to hope we can do managers a little bit and uh, let slowly, slowly, mediocrity to build something. And if somebody doing a good project like Sam Simonian or James Tufekian or Eduard Nernikian or some others, okay, it's great, but it's not changing in environment in general. Well, I think you've, the one thing you keep coming back on is the, again, it's the competency of the state, because you cannot have a partnership without a competent state uh, that can actually follow through and, and reach that understanding. Uh, I'm glad uh, you started this conversation with saying that it's time to uh, reflect and it's time to question everything. Because uh, if there's ever a time to do that, it's now. Uh, and, I, and I think it's not just, uh, I think I'll, I'll go beyond that. We need to look at the realities, uh, you know, straight in the face, the darkest realities and not blink. Because there's always a way out. I'm not, uh, uh, I've, I've said this before, you know, a, a free people with agency will always find its way out, one way or the other. It won't be perfect. You know, we even had a political crisis that in, you know, with our very dysfunctional political class, they actually managed to you know, create a new election and hopefully that to resolve some of those issues. So we have a way out. But I want to go back to if there's one thing, one thing that from your perspective that we need to question above all else uh, of what we have done, not just in the last 30 years, but in the last 100 years, what is that? I think the biggest challenge for us, like a nation, is what it means to have a state. Mm -hmm. Because our relation with the state was always was question. We've been under 800 years under big. Uh, <coughs> model. It was model where we were living in an external nation-controlled state, and I think our relation with the state is one of the key core points. Because Armenians has a unique character. We can live any place in the world. We build our church. We build our school. So it's a small Armenia. The question is: Armenia. What is Armenia today here? is our motherland, and are we ready to give everything to this motherland, really prosper, happy place to people who live here or not? And I think one of the core questions for all of us, are we ready to move from Paris, from Moscow, from London, from, I don't know, San Francisco to here and really change the country and make our commitment, not just supporting, but really transforming this nation to the state, culture, behavior type of the uh, attitude, which is, again, didn't exist before. And this is the last hundred years. We can talk about Soviet type separately, but in the first Armenian Republic and, and now, after the last 30 years, our biggest issue was, are we building the state which we really want to start? It? Because we got the state, let's be honest, Eric. In 1991, of course, the Karabakh movement pushed the Soviet Union collapse. But it was not like Israel is established. It was not the dream of the uh, hundreds of thousands of people who not only dream but really put their commitment, mm -hmm. moved to kibbutz. How many of us, it was some people who move it, but it's very small percentage mm -hmm. if you're looking at the reality. This is why without, for example, 150, 200,000 people coming to Armenia back now, we cannot change country. We cannot build competence 
or it will take us 20, 30 years because mm -hmm. the competency you cannot build in one day. Mm -hmm. We're talking about failed state and the question why we didn't push very hard and say, guys, it's not, it's not bad, but it's a new state, we're just learning, let's try to maximize the experience of people who can come outside from Armenia and together build a new state with the obligation and responsibility of the Institute of But we say, no, 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 we don't want it. Let's, let's go case by case. We had some example, like again, Rafi Ovanesian or Vartan or whatever. Um, Oskanyan. Oskanyan, Vartan Oskanyan or something. But it was a few, right? And it was not like, let's see who is the best in this area, in doctors or in political field or in uh, managing the agriculture business. So let's try to bring them, let's try to learn from them. And I think it's one of the key challenges what we are facing. We didn't have a bureaucracy. Again, don't forget, in 1945, it was only 75 states exist in the world. Now it's 220. It's not only us, it's many other countries facing the same challenge. How are you building the efficient state institutions the power of this distribution of the power. It's a big, challenging, very difficult task. What we didn't make, the elite didn't come together. So, okay, how we can really build the state with the model which we can use different uh, other countries, other nations' uh, examples, and really we can do it jointly. And I think it's one of the key points that we are facing again and again, we can, how well we can collectively work. I think one of the uniqueness of Armenia 2020 was what we've been doing this whole project, which I'm so proud. It's not Ruben Vardanyan, a rich person, give his money to the sum of the projects. It's a, more of thousands of partners and colleagues give money to the Armenian projects, some of them non-Armenian. And I think it's the most, most important element of success of Armenia 2020, which was Nubar and myself, we didn't know each other before. We're not from Beirut or from Moscow. We met and we talked about vision, which we shared together and said, okay, how this vision can become reality. And we engaged many people like Pierre Gurdjian from Belgium, Andrei Andonian from Germany, uh, Russian non-Armenians from Armenia, who came together because not because they like us or they know us from the kindergarten, because they, they like the vision. And this is very important. Without destination, without saying what kind of the vision, what, what kind of country we want to build, without talking about this openly and professionally and going top-down approach, but also going to bottom to up, bring these two approaches together, we cannot make this. That's why, unfortunately, our, the main, major biggest failure is our elite. I will say, if you ask me, Eric, where is the failure coming? It's not about name. We have great people. We have fantastic people. We have people who really give their lives without talking about anything, thinking about anything. But our responsibility as elite is absolutely, is, uh, was not executed. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't manage our duties well. I will say honestly. Well, uh, since you made perhaps the most important point in almost all of my conversations, I'm not going to say. I'm not going to add anything more to it. Be honest with you, because uh, uh, our elite institutions. The fact is, uh, you have to come here and you have to make a difference, and you have to also look at ourselves critically because. For many in, in the for many in the diaspora, Armenia is like a, a it's a Disneyland theme park with Armenian themes, but it's not that it's a country. For many, Armenia is a national liberation movement. It's not that it's a country. So you either get serious about building the country, or you're wasting your time. So uh, I'm I'm very glad you ended in that note. I want to thank you for all you've done. I want to thank you for this initiative, and I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Eric. But if I may say sure. my last two uh, sentence about what we just talked about, sentence. thank you first of all for inviting me. And, uh, and first of all, what you're doing, by the way, what you're doing is great, talking about the many difficult issues in your uh, <coughs> programs. Thank you. But I want to say very important three things about what we need to do. If we really believe this is the right time, it's a good time to come to Armenia and change Armenia. And I want to ask everyone who is sitting in different part of the world and thinking about Armenia, it's a unique opportunity to make the changes. So I, I'm encouraging all of you to really think to, if you, if you want to see Armenia is a country which will be proud to live and be associated, that is the best time is now. The second, the world is helping us. The, the challenges happening in America, in Russia, or in, in everywhere where we're living, it's showing one very important in Beirut, in Lebanon. Guys, look, everywhere is a lot of challenges. Where you can find other safe place, but you feel at least it's your homeland. It's not, it, it, before you say, oh, it's blue bad here, I will go from Be Lebanon to Canada, or from Canada to, I don't know, Mexico, or from Mexico to some other. It's not anymore. Everywhere is a terrible, vulnerable. That's why my second point is the 
timing of allowing people to think everything about the strategy long term, not only about Armenia like homeland, but also about what is your strategy about where you live. And the third, technology allowing us to be part of the world being in Armenia. This I think is unique combination where we can become first nation who can build state network cooperation, not to fight like it's happened 9-11 in 2001 or, no, or happened in 2021, 8, January 8 when the Trump was switched off from Twitter. But first time we as a nation can again, like we've been first Christian country in the world, we can become first example Did of building of the state and network cooperation, which will show how it can be prosper and good for the nation, for the state, but also for the world. Thank you, Mr. Vartanian. Uh, this is your host of uh, Subhanet Eric Kopian, and thank you for joining us for this enlightening conversation.